Good afternoon and welcome to this week's Halftime Talk. We're absolutely delighted to be joined this week by His Excellency Engineer Tarek El Mulla, the Minister of Petroleum and Mineral Resources for the Great Republic of Egypt. Your Excellency, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Evers. Uh, thank you for hosting me and it's my pleasure to be uh, with you this afternoon. Thank you, sir. I'd just like to start off with a little bit of reflection on 2020, the great disruption when oil supply and demand and, and the whole dynamics of the energy world went out of uh, great dislocation. I'm wondering what lessons learned, what do you take away into 2021 about last year? Well, um, to tell you the truth, what happened was of course uh, an unprecedented uh, uh, nightmare uh, that has uh, hurt the, uh, uh, the entire world. So uh, if you were not ready and prepared for any uh, emergency or any uh, surprise, uh, the country and the people would be at risk. And uh, hence, what I can tell you that uh, uh, we in Egypt, uh, since we had started uh, a good uh, and embarked a good journey of economic re reform since 2016. Uh, I think uh, if we wouldn't have gone through this uh, successful journey, we wouldn't have been able to withstand this challenge uh, that hurt the economy globally. And definitely Egypt was not uh, far of this, uh, but because we had uh, good uh, uh, reforms in place, we were resilient and we were able to uh, withstand this challenge and uh, uh, taking this uh, into uh, my segment uh, where my file of responsibility, I would say that uh, we, had, uh, uh, we had good uh, strategy uh, a few years back of uh, uh, removing and uh, uh, going to uh, uh, non-subsidized fuel and uh, hence uh, uh, putting the uh, cost prices of the product to the market. Accordingly, we've seen over the last few years a reasonable uh, uh, volume of consumption. Uh, before that, it was, of course, absurd. It was crazy. The yeah. consumption was increasing uh, dramatically because prices were very cheap. So what I want to say from that, that we were able then to manage right. the, uh, the, the, uh, the supply and demand. And accordingly, when, when such a crisis came, we were able to uh, uh, think and to take the uh, proper actions. We had already some uh, storage capacities and we were able to do some uh, hedging uh, uh, purchases with uh, uh, long-term uh, hedged uh, contracts, uh, as well as we were able to have uh, uh, some uh, um, 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 intelligent and smart operations where we were able to uh, uh, focus our uh, refineries to produce, uh, uh, let me say, one product versus the other. And this was a very simple one, like when we said, since uh, there was travel bans, nobody was traveling in the world, there is no tourism, there is no uh, flights. Accordingly, we did not need uh, jet uh, fuel. So we, we've been able to tune our, uh, our refineries to produce more uh, gas, oil, diesel, rather than having uh, the jet. Hence, we were able to, uh, uh, to uh, to cover the needs of the market with our local production. And right. we, we had like a two consecutive months of non uh, uh, importing uh, a liter of uh, diesel or gas oil uh, from abroad. When uh, you look at the international part of that story where obviously the great collapse in global demand and the activities of the OPEC plus countries to correct, to cut supply, support price, 
uh, try to bring balance back to the market. How did that uh, impact you? And what is your outlook going forward for sort of global supply demand coming back to balance in 2021? Yeah. Well, this is exactly why we took these measures that I explained because of this cuts and this uh, 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 uncomfortable and uh, uh, risky uh, circumstances at that times where uh, OPEC and OPEC Plus uh, were, were trying to balance the, the, the great collapse of uh, crude prices. So we took the measures that I spoke about. And mm -hmm. on the other hand, uh, we are at the same time, while we are still a net importer, but we are a producing country. So when we say we are a producing country, it means that we have partners, we have international oil companies operating in Egypt, and they are also looking at their uh, profits and they are looking at their balance sheet and their uh, cash flows. Uh, uh, of course, they were uh, in a position where thinking of uh, uh, reducing their uh, costs and this could lead to a reduction in production, but uh, we were able to uh, have uh, some uh, uh, continuous dialogue and continuous meetings with them uh, in order to ensure that uh, this wouldn't happen because if they reduce their production, this means a, a bigger gap uh, in my, uh, from my side accordingly, uh, bigger uh, increase in imports, which we want to avoid. When you look at that, that uh, cutbacks from the industry side, we saw globally about 30% reduction in capital expenditure uh, in 2020 from the international energy companies. How has that impacted Egypt? And, and, and how, what is your outlook for the year ahead in terms of capital expenditure on new supply? This is true and the, uh, the uh, CapEx uh, cuts was reflected definitely to all operations, including Egypt definitely. And uh, uh, what we were working on together is now that these cuts uh, were uh, stretched uh, uh, in order not to be reflected on the decrease in production so we were stretching our operations in order not to uh, uh, to get hurt from the reduction in capex. But you could not do this for a long time. So therefore, uh, uh, sitting with them for the, the year twenty one, as we speak now, uh, we are discussing with them in order to uh, uh, to build together uh, the outlook of twenty one, because. Uh, we have to have our input in their uh, outlook because uh, if, if we need them to continue investment and continue exploration and production, we need to put them our insights, as you say. So our insights is our vision, uh, uh, not only domestic market, but also regional, as you know. And this is part of why we talk about uh, uh, regional and East Mediterranean and all these initiatives that we took few years back and I think that these are yielding fruits and uh, I think with the uh, latest uh, announcements that we had together with our founding countries uh, for the AMGF in September, uh, I think this is uh, to demonstrate that uh, we walk the talk and accordingly uh, uh, putting together the uh, budget for uh, 2021 uh, would then go for let me say more of uh, less risky uh, uh, opportunities for them and this is understood of course and we try to embrace and to understand uh, and where where are those priorities from the your point of view in terms of where you would put investment is it in the downstream or is it in the upstream are you looking to build more refineries are you looking to see more upstream production no uh, it is really uh, about upstream and it is more about uh, gas and it is more about offshore. And uh, of course, uh, this does not mean that the ongoing uh, improvement uh, 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 for brown fields and uh, other uh, uh, fields uh, that are still 
uh, underway for uh, uh, improvement of production. But I mean, for a green fields, we go for offshore, we go for gas. Uh, as for downstream, as you rightly said, we had originally a, a refinery a strategy projects that is undergoing, but this is mostly uh, taken by the government. So these are uh, uh, government projects that we are uh, uh, committed in order to uh, fulfill uh, the uh, uh, needs of the local and domestic market, needs of refined project of refined products. Therefore, uh, uh, we are uh, still continuing on, on our uh, refining uh, projects until uh, we uh, reach the self-sufficiency of refined products by year 23. Any particular example, refinery in, in any particular parts of the country? Yes, Anything yes. you can share? Yeah, of course. We have uh, 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 two, three uh, major projects that we are undergoing now. Uh, uh, in Alexandria, we have the, the, the famous uh, Midor uh, refinery that we are uh, expanding now 60% of its capacity and then will be on stream by mid-23. Uh, we have also uh, uh, another uh, big uh, project in south of Egypt, uh, uh, in Asyut, for a hydro, big hydro cracker uh, that will uh, be concluded by end of 23. And uh, we uh, also are, uh, we, we just completed two other projects uh, here, one in Cairo and one in Alexandria uh, uh, in September and in August uh, 2020. But at the same time, uh, and we are going to, uh, and we've just, let me say, uh, started our commissioning for a project in Asyut for, for gasoline pro, uh, products, so that we would be able to uh, cover south of Egypt's needs in, on, in to order to avoid transportation from north to south. This is right. one thing. But at the same time, we are focusing more on uh, petrochemical projects. And this is where we see the added value and where uh, our country imports a lot of uh, uh, final uh, petrochemical products, and and this is uh, uh, and this is a huge opportunity given you've a hundred million people. I mean, you've got a big consumer right. market in 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 Egypt. Just going back to the gas offshore upstream development, how has the recent increase in gas LNG prices? impacted you and impacted your decision making is it a good thing is it helpful is it not what's your thoughts no of course this is very good and this is helpful because uh, uh, in 2020 uh, the prices were very stre uh, stressed very uh, 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 very low and we were not able to export except few cargos uh, throughout the year uh, but what I tell you that uh, starting from October 2020 till now, we have uh, we have already booked all our uh, 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 volumes for uh, to be exported from the uh, Etco uh, plant, which is uh, uh, east of Alexandria, and uh, uh, we have uh, let me say uh, uh, already uh, cargos up to. March up to end of March. And uh, what is your capacity at the moment, and what are you hoping it can grow to? Well, uh, we have a capacity of uh, about eight million tons currently, and uh, 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 with the uh, reopening of the Damietta plant uh, after settling the uh, arbitration cases with the, the uh, partners, uh, and we expect this to uh, be. Uh, in uh, operation or re-operating -oper re once again uh, towards the end of February, uh, we will add another 4.5 million tons. So we'll have a total capacity of 12.5 million tons of the capacity of export capacity of LNG. It certainly seems like a good time to increase. I mean, given the exactly. demand the growing and yet the there isn't a lot of new capacity being built other than in Qatar, I think, and America a little bit. Uh, you recently awarded nine uh, oil and gas concessions. Um, what do they focus on and would you expect to be offering any more? Yeah, well, the awards were uh, for the uh, our west side of the Mediterranean uh, offshore. And uh, uh, we were able to, for the first time, to have 
some super major oil companies like ExxonMobil and Chevron. And uh, uh, these are, uh, this is a great opportunity because these were untapped and unexplored areas, uh, offshore areas that we have in Egypt, uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, this has also uh, uh, not ended the, uh, only for uh, ExxonMobil and Chevron, but we, it was awarded also to other uh, major companies like uh, Total, uh, BP, and Shell, together with some other partners, regional partners like Mubadala and Kofpik. And I think that uh, this is a good opportunity. But at the same time, uh, and for the first time, we were able to uh, award also three important blocks in, in the Red Sea. And uh, the Red Sea is also uh, unexplored and underdeveloped and has not been touched yet. Uh, we've been awarding for Chevron also and Shell and Mubadala. So uh, I think- Is that Mubadala are... Petroleum? Yes, yes, exactly. So this is something uh, very exciting for us, very important. And uh, we are expecting to launch uh, uh, some, uh, perhaps in the coming uh, week or two, uh, some offshore Mediterranean uh, Delta, the, our offshore Delta, uh, Nile Delta uh, Mediterranean uh, areas and the Eastern side of our Mediterranean, as well as some onshore Western desert and Eastern desert. And this will be uh, uh, some blocks uh, that are offered by both EGPC and EGAS. The, and these will be awarded or these will be open for tender? No, this, uh, this is a new bid round. This new will bid. be open for tender, yes, exactly. Okay. The uh, Eastern Mediterranean Gas yes. Forum, which of course you have been personally a, 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 you know, a significant shepherd of, what do you hope for that organization? Some people have called it the OPEC of gas in the East Med. What, what do you think or what do you hope it can be in three to five years? I, I hope it would be uh, an organization that would uh, uh, successfully uh, manage uh, this uh, uh, resource of gas uh, among the countries at the East Mediterranean in order to have this gas uh, as a catalyst uh, for the welfare and the well-being of the people of these countries and for the economies of these countries. Uh, I think that uh, it will open um, and will uh, give a lot of opportunities for the countries, uh, not only the founding countries, but also for uh, companies and international organizations that are interested in, uh, uh, in such a business and it will be a very good and useful uh, forum for uh, several uh, organizations, countries, and companies to uh, cooperate and to uh, get out of uh, the, to get benefit out of that uh, cooperation. I think. Do you, do you, do you advocate for gas to be a transition fuel in the great energy transition as we look to decarbonize the global economy gas has a big role to play will the uh, emgf play that role play a part in that yes definitely i think that uh, uh, since the gas will be there it will be uh, an important resource that countries uh, that have common interest in this uh, forum will be able to uh, uh, access this gas that is definitely the, tran the transition energy that is required for the world. And uh, I think uh, Egypt has been a, a model for uh, using the gas as a transition. I just want to give you an, a quick example that now in Egypt, all our uh, power plants are fired by gas. No fuel now at all uh, that uh, is uh, 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 is used for uh, for the power plants uh, and now we have an important project of uh, uh, going for and 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 transforming a lot of uh, vehicles uh, whether uh, diesel uh, run or gasoline run to be run by cng compressed natural gas of course this uh, was a project that we had 25 years ago but now the country is pushing and advocating and supporting and giving some good initiatives and incentives for motorists to use CNG. And these are 
in addition to our important uh, important project is in transforming people using from LPG bottles to uh, uh, natural gas household connections. That Which of course able- is very important for the air quality in, in Cairo or else you're just gonna end up with very big healthcare bills. So you, you can save uh, on many levels uh, given that. Are, are you also uh, uh, removing gas flaring at, in the oil fields? Is that completely sure. gone? Exactly, sure. This is one of our uh, priorities and uh, we are here cooperating really with the uh, with the important uh, financing organizations like the EBRD and so forth, and they are helping us to uh, uh, to reach the zero flaring. Uh, we have a target for that. Yes. Well, Your Excellency, I think we will wrap up the interview there and thank you very much for being on this week's halftime talk. His Excellency Engineer Tarek El Mola, the Minister of Petroleum and Mineral Resources of Egypt. Shukran Katir. Thank you very much, Mr. Evers. It was my pleasure being with you today with Gulf Intelligence and with your good self. Thank you. Thank you.